yeah, hello, uh, I'm Peter Watkins and uh, with uh, some of my family and friends we're here in Grutor Park, uh, which is uh, about two hours drive south of Vilnius in Lithuania. Uh, it's actually a very evocative and rather strange sort of theme park we're in as you will have probably seen by <clears throat> some of the images. A local entrepreneur here went round the backyards of Vilnius uh, some few years ago collecting together all the statues of Lenin, Marx and the other merry band that he could find and brought them out to this swampland in the south of Lithuania and constructed a theme park to the Soviet period. Not all Lithuanians like the idea of this, to some, of course, since Lithuania was an enforced member state of the Soviet Union until 1991. To a number of Lithuanians, it is a disaster to, as they see it, put these statues of these murderers in a sylvan setting with birds twittering and trees. But I think probably to others in this country, I hope and I'm sure there are others who see this as a possibility to really reflect on, well, on many things, but certainly on man's unbelievable folly and inhumanity, and I suppose the endless repetition, sadly, of history, because this is a theme park to the Soviet Union. It is quite likely, maybe not here, but in another area in Lithuania or anywhere else in Europe in the next few years, hopefully, there'll be a theme park to globalization with its pathetic relics littered around and people looking at these with perhaps as much amusement as they as they look at this stuff here and this soviet system as you all know of course was held in place by an extremely efficient system of terror propaganda complicity power fear etc etc held in process held in system by a, held in place by an incredible system of terror. Now what about the system we're living through today, which is certainly can be labeled one uh, which is as stupid as the Soviet system. The Soviet system took mil the lives of countless millions of people and so today is global globalization taking the lives of many people by neglect, exploitation, you know as well as I what is happening. And what holds this system in place today? In this theme park, in a few years' time, if there's a theme park to glo globalization, what will be here? There probably won't be statues of Marx and Lenin, there'll be advertising banners for McDonald's and shop windows full of about 55 highly colored plastic mobile telephones and there will certainly be a television set certainly up on a very big plinth because I think at least I hope that very few of us today doubt that the system today we live in which I keep calling globalization you can call it neoliberal market whatever you want blah blah I'll call it globalization is being held in power by not the same system of terror, quite, at least not in our comfortable European society, but it is being held in place by the mass media. Constantly propagating, constantly encourage, encouraging, constantly insinuating us to maintain and ever develop a consumer society. And it's doing it in all kinds of subtle, insidious ways. And evidently, because of the passivity of most of us, that most of us are manifesting, it's working very well. 
And we're engaging in a sense in part of that process. I mean, I'm speaking to you, uh, excuse me for doing this, but it's maybe we can at least use it to look at the, the hierarchical process I'm using to speak to you, from me to you. <clears throat> I don't know where, where you'll be seeing this, but I imagine possibly maybe on a television set, I sincerely hope not, but it may be the case, but certainly maybe in a cinema or somewhere or in a schoolroom, and you'll be sitting looking at me. But it's not communication. We call this mass communication. It has nothing to do with communication. Communication, <clears throat> check in the dictionary if you, if you don't believe me, is a two-way living process, a give and exchange. A mass communication, so-called, has nothing to do with real communication at all. It is a systematically organized, one-way path from the producer to the spectator. Constantly. Constantly. And that is not communication. We should try and find some other word for it. And it's certainly manipulation. And it's certainly a hierarchical process. And I'm doing it to you. At least I'm trying to talk about it. Doesn't ultimately change the fact that this is a hierarchical process. And this, forgive my sort of preamble, but I think this theme park does help us to sense the question of history. We are in history today, even if growing numbers of people, especially unfortunately young people, are losing or never even discovering what history is. We are a part of history. History is an ongoing, flowing process. In 1871, the citizens of Paris, a considerable number of them, rose against the system, the exploitative, corrupt system, hierarchical system, which existed then and for a few months, set to May 1871. And other, other towns in France, I think about five or six, set to May 1871. And other, other towns in France, I think about five or six others, including Marseille and Lyon, I think, also set up communes, but they were suppressed and crushed very early. The Paris Commune stayed, despite many difficulties, for about two months before it was brutally suppressed by the um, French army, senior generals of the French army, who massacred up to approximately approximately 30,000 men, women and children, many of whom played no part in the Commune at all, were massacred on the streets of Paris. Some were sent into exile, some were sent into prison, most were killed on the spot. And that's history. But is it? How do we know? It's the mass media in France, the media in France, very, very touchy to talk about the Paris Commune. Very rarely is there anything in the French media. Yes, there have been a number of films, maybe I suppose you could count perhaps, I don't know, 20 or 30 documentaries which will sound a lot, but actually small documentary films, short films shown maybe late at night and, and never broadly shown, never broadly diffused, never broadly discussed. The education system in France, to its eternal shame, I don't th even think it, you can dignify it with the expression education system. Uh, it has uh, occulted, as the French say, or marginalized the Paris Commune always, since hundred and whatever years. And you can find only a few lines in the French history books. So our, our, our relationship to history is a very tenuous one. And we're sort of like on a cliff edge, you know, slipping but holding on with our fingers. Never more so than today. And uh, I suppose all these thoughts and these concerns brought me to, and the subject of itself brought me to the Paris Commune some years ago. Amazing subject, a subject of resistance, of commitment, of sacrifice, of uh, a belief in a belief in utopia, uh, of personal commitment to the ultimate that one was prepared to die for what one believed in, which is not exactly a commitment that is very broad spread today in Western culture, to say the least. And uh, so I, ma I made this with the help of a lot of people. I, or I should really say we, made this film La Commune. And um, 
this this film is is to me is 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 very important because it's dealing not only with this amazing subject Paris Commune it's dealing with the crisis in the mass audiovisual media television cinema radio it's dealing at least indirectly with the crisis in education meaning the crisis in media education where teachers are teaching or are supposed to be teaching what the media is which is a huge industry today and and um the film is dealing, trying to deal with these things, and in its process and its form, is trying to offer alternatives to the existing process, to the existing, to the existing media process. The film, these crises, the crisis, the crises, globalization, the media, they implicate all of us. They implicate media professionals today senior executives, commissioning editors, filmmakers, producers, many of whom, and of course there are exceptions, but many of whom have become deeply complicitous in this hierarchical process today, who refuse to do anything but genuflect to the demands of the thugs running global television, who refuse to challenge what I call the monoform, this is the way of cutting a film into small little discrete bits, cut, 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 once every three to five seconds, and dense bombardment of sound, constantly moving the camera. You know, you know this as well as I, but it's important to recognize this as an organized language form. It has nothing to do with the complex, fluid possibilities of the cinema or of television, either as forms of creation of artistic expression or of communication. This thing, the monoform, which has become the enforced code with which all television films and virtually everything coming out of the commercial cinema has to be structured. Cut, move, jigger, jolt, cut, bing, bang, cut, cut, cut. You know how it's going and the cuts are, are coming now faster and faster. And it's virtually, virtually like MTV and stuff. This also has nothing to do with communication. It doesn't allow the people watching, the spectator, to be a genuine participant. You're dragged along the, mon the monolinear narrative structure by this rapidly changing uh, manipulative grid structure, the monoform, which is done deliberately because it, it means that we do not have time to think or to in any democratic way to enter the process to challenge, to ask questions. This, this is done today deliberately. Uh, I think, as, as, as one of my friends here today, today pointed out, Lenin, this picture you, you may have seen, of one of the images here pointed out that the, the, the most important art form, or the most important art, is the art of the cinema. Mussolini, I think, said the most powerful art form is the cinema. And need, I, need I even mention Goebbels, who, whose use of radio was very, very specific during, during the maintenance of power by, by, by the Third Reich. And he said something about, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something about what we have got here, I think he meant the radio, but he was probably also talking about the television because um, well, the television was actually developing in Nazi Germany, but there was also the cinema. And the cinema took the German newsreels, the combat newsreels, for example, the invasion of Poland. It's a typical example. And they would send the, the, the Wehrmacht cameraman in with the frontline troops. Cameraman would film uh, the storming of Danzig or whatever. They would rush the negative back to laboratories in Berlin, I imagine, or somewhere, and by lorry they would drive the, the prints all over Germany. So probably the next day or the following day, the Germans were sitting there uh, looking at the newsreels within a day or so of the event. And Goebbels knew how effective this was in maintaining the system and had some incredible statement about the real, this, is, this represents the real way to reach the heart of people. He talked about the heart of people. And this is what we're doing today with the monoform. We're systematically, deliberately fixating 
countless millions of people in front of the screen, the small screen of television, the large screen of the cinema, fixed into a hierarchical thing. And we, the public, are systematically buying into this. In North America alone, I don't know what the figures are in Europe, they're probably fairly horrendous. I think it's a figure for two years ago, 1998. The North American public invested, put into the box office, $50 billion. You imagine that? $50 billion in one year was spent by the public in distraction, entertainment, slothing off, whatever we do, having a kick. Now, I, you know, at this moment in time, <clears throat> you know as well as I that the incredible cost of globalization today to, to humanity, and for example, I think, I don't have a figure here, but I think it is 32 million people in developing countries are suffering from the AIDS virus now who can't afford the medication because of the pharmaceutical companies and so on and so forth. Can you imagine what even a portion of $50 billion spent on endless shit, audiovisual shit? Can you imagine what we could do with that money? What could be done, the lives that could be saved? Do you think there's any debate about this? In my profession, or in schools where teachers, are, of course there isn't. Do you think there's any debate about the monoform? Do you think there's any debate about the reactionary, hierarchical, totally undemocratic process that the media is? Of course there isn't. As, as I've said, media professionals, most of them, are so afraid now of stepping an inch out of line for fear of losing their budgets. The fear is unbelievable in television and the cinema today, particularly in television. And in schools, we could, you could come with me, we could go to classroom in, in classrooms in France, England, Lithuania, North America, it doesn't matter. You, you would very rarely find young people who know anything about the monoform, the real possibilities of communication that there are in the cinema and television. You'd find instead students who have completely lost their history. I, they probably are not even sure who President Kennedy is now. I'm not joking. And increasingly academics, who should know since they're a part of the problem, are discussing this. Students who don't know what World War II is, no idea of the issues behind World War I, vaguely may have heard of President Kennedy, and um, a, a German, excuse me, I'm not sure if he's a German, uh, anyway, uh, Yes, possibly, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> a journalist wrote an article in a paper which came out a few weeks ago. And, uh, excuse me, I'm not sure if he's German or American, but anyway, it really doesn't matter. He wrote this. <clears throat> I've recently returned to Austin, Texas, after teaching at universities in Berlin and Cologne. I was accustomed to the, to the indifference American students display whenever they read about foreigners assaulting McDonald's or denouncing Hollywood's domination of the international film market. American students live in the belly of the global beast, so they are befuddled by complaints about America's cultural impact on the world. But, to my astonishment, I encountered the same complacency about the globalization of American culture among German students. They are comfortable with, or at least resigned, to the omnipresence of global culture. They do not worry that their language is being subverted by English words, or that their tastes are shaped by Hollywood blockbusters, or that their local bookstores are threatened by Amazon.com. They have little attachment to the cultural past, nor can they contemplate any alternatives to the globalised world they inhabit. They are neither rebels nor conservatives. The young simply shrug. And then later in the article, the journalist or the teacher continues, the majority of the young in Germany and America, and of course he could add a lot of other countries to the list, have little interest in politics. And they are untroubled by what they see on their movie, television or computer screens. 
So they may be the first generation that is unlikely to protest the spread of globalization, either in economics or culture. Well, of course, that's a controversial statement because it's like all things in this complex world. It's both true and untrue. There are a considerable number of young people, thank God, considerable number, who are joining the forces of uh, those protesting against globalization. And it's very, very important to underline that. However, sort of yin and yang, balance one way or another. Unfortunately, also what I think this teacher writes is also very true. In generalization, if we can generalize, the larger majority of students, through no fault of their own, are losing their history and are being pushed or forced or manipulated or encouraged, let's really say, into an increasingly passive role vis-a-vis -vis society. And that's something that, that should really, really concern us very, very much. Um, before I, I, I want to close the minute and just obviously say something about this film, La Commune, I just want to say one other thing about um, the role of activists and those protesting globalization today, which is, of course, amazing and marvelous that this is happening. However, we should not overlook the fact that uh, amongst the protests there is very, very little towards or concerning the use of the mass audiovisual media. There we are at a state, we're like 50 years behind with that one, really. And uh, I've noticed and I've in fact documented in my own way over the last 20 years the resistance by many activist groups towards criticizing the mass media. There's a very, very serious, confusing, complex, and real phenomenon. The mass media is always set aside. Maybe it's because of our traditional relationship to the Hollywood we love, or to our favorite television show. Who knows what's involved here? It is also because many activists, at least I'm not so sure now, but certainly in recent years, like some of the global peace movements, used television to convey their alternative message. They used the system. But of course they used exactly the same manipulative system, they used the monoform. And so nothing changed. So I think that the historical resistance by many activists to actually challenging the mass audiovisual media is a very serious problem. And my personal belief is that until this subject is pulled up level with the other level with the other subjects being protested, the other problems being protested. I genuinely do not believe that the anti-globalization uh, protest will ever reach its true fruition. If we leave the cinema and television and the radio in the present position they're in, we will never get there. Uh, I made La Commune to raise these questions, mixed in, of course, with the questions of personal commitment, the theme of the Paris Commune itself, and, and, and what I'm hoping is that what people can do, what you can do, is to use this film as a resource and a tool. Uh, some people, perhaps many people, find it very bizarre that it's so long. Please, see this length as a resource not a threat, not a personal idiosyncrasy. See it as a resource, as a challenge. It doesn't mean that all alternative films have to be five hours long. Far from it. This one is for very real reasons. And the, and the experience of seeing it, and of, if you want, of having the patience to swim in a fluid-like way through the process of this film, I believe is something that can be seen in a very positive and innovative way because it is totally changing the relationship between the audience, the traditional relationship between the audience and the spectator. The co La Commune the film has a very, very particular form, a language form. It has the monoform in some parts, and for that, certainly, I can be criticized. And the film certainly has faults, because it's also hierarchical, but those are there to be debated. 
but it has these very, very long um, plan séquences, as they're called in French, the, the sequences, long sequences, where I didn't often know what was going to happen, <laughs> neither. sometimes did the cast, and, but, but it offered space for people to say what they wanted and for, and for change. And this idea is, a, is an idea of generosity, with which the majority of the mass media is totally unfamiliar, because they don't want spontaneous reflection. They want instant, um, prepackaged response from people. That's what the monoform is about. La Commune also has a very, very complex and important process, both with the audience, through its form and its content, but also with the people in it, who probably are better called participants rather than actors, who, who worked in a very, very... who put a, an enormous amount of themselves into the film. And that's another tremendous example of ge generosity from this film, is what the people in it give of themselves knowing that they're exposed, exposing themselves, in a sense, publicly on, on the screen. I think there's a... If, 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 if we, if you are prepared to work with this film, it can be an amazing tool and resource for, in a, not just for deconstructing the mass audiovisual media, but as, as, a, as a, just one of many, a alternative vision of what television could have become were it not prevented 30 years ago by the thugs ruling it. Uh, well, I'll just start by saying there are three sort of ways, I suppose, of approaching how you can work with this film. Well, there's many ways, but um, I guess hierarchically I'll, I'll begin with, with one thing I can offer. I, I've done some teaching and discussion notes here, uh, which, are, which will shortly be in French. And so if teachers or groups working with the film would like to see some of my ideas about questions that could be raised in a discussion, they're just questions, uh, that is there if you, if you find that of any help. But as I, as I stress in these, in these notes, <clears throat> probably all they can do is to help maybe break the ice and start. And the most important uh, information and ideas will come from the debate process. Some of the participants in the film uh, formed themselves into a group called Rebond pour la commune. Rebond or rebound, it's a little difficult to translate into English, so I'll keep the French word rebond for the commune uh, because they were very encouraged and interested by the process in making the film, which began well before the film started and continued during the film, and then the rebonders, as we call them, or they call themselves, continued this process of meeting, and they now have formed an association in France, and they are there to help, help you with ideas or just to help you to get going, not just to show this film. That's not the ultimate point. The point is to move far beyond La Commune, to, to trying to find different ways to energize or re-energize or reinvent the civic process, debate where we have disagreements, but real citizen participation in history. I don't know if we'll ever be fortunate enough to avoid finally having to sit in a theme park to globalization. I somewhat doubt that we'll be able but let's at least hope that the theme park will be able to be constructed pretty soon, within the next year or so, with your help. And we'll be, I'll be sort of sitting on, or somebody else actually, hopefully not me, will be sitting on top of a television set, eating a bag of chips, and or actually preferably not eating a bag of chips, and looking out at the water. Because we've got to just, really, we have to break out of this passive mode that the mass media has put us into and unfortunately that so much of the education system which has become deeply complicitous with the media now in encouraging the lack of debate the passive acceptance of the media popular culture as though there is nothing else and there's a whole world of alternatives and a whole world of alternative processes 
Well, I'll, I'll stop. I'm sorry about the monologue, um, but uh, I really hope you'll dissolve my monologue in your in your debate. So, so I'll, I'll say goodbye and thank you very much for your help and your work with the, with the film.